Métis were children of indigenous women and European fur traders in the Red River area, now known as Manitoba. It dates back to as early as 1973 during the Alexander Mackenzie expedition. The Métis people developed their own language called Michif, which is a unique blend of French and the Cree language that is still used today. Roughly 33% of all Canada's Aboriginal population is Métis. Métis means mixed. The Métis Nation Blue Infinity Flag is the oldest continuous used flag in Canada and it represents the mixing of two cultures. Métis were often called flower beadwork people due to their combination of French floral embroidery mixed with Aboriginal porcupine quilt work. Métis are well known for their finger woven sash, which is referred to as l'assumption sash, and it is the most recognizable symbol of Métis heritage. A sash was often used as a belt, tow rope, tump line, or even as a sewing kit. They're made of wool. Louis Riel was a Canadian politician, a founder of the province of Manitoba, and a political leader of the Métis people. He led two resistance movements against the government of Canada and its first prime minister, John A. Macdonald. Riel sought to defend Métis rights and identity as the Northwest Territories came progressively under the Canadian sphere of influence. Louis Riel Day is on November 16. The Métis Nation of British Columbia was founded in 1996 and is still going strong today. Well, first off, I'd like to thank you for joining the uh, Northeast BC Métis Storytelling Project. Um, I'm not sure if Darlene um, kind of went into depth about it, but it's essentially gathering elders and uh, we want to uh, share their stories and their wisdom and their teachings so that, you know, future generations and even past generations, uh, well, maybe not past, but future, hopefully, yes. uh, can still uh, know, get to know you and uh, maybe even other Métis citizens. So thank you for joining us. You're welcome. So with that in mind, why don't we start uh, with uh, hearing a little bit about you. Um, why don't you tell us your name and uh, if you were named after someone. Okay, my name is Brenda Ghostkeeper Seymour, and I was born in Pouskipie, BC. And no, I wasn't, well, they kind of tease that I was named after my brother's girlfriend. Her name was Brenda. And I'm not even sure the last name, but <laughs> doesn't matter. Yeah. And what about um, your family last name, Ghostkeeper? Do you know any history on that? Oh, it's very interesting in history, yeah. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, well, our last name is supposed to be Richards. And uh, it's a French name, Richards. And um, how we got the name Ghostkeeper, my probably about the third generation grandfather was a, a keeper, keeper of the ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, he, he looked after the bodies like we're preparing for burials. And uh, so in Cree, they called him Keeper of the Ghosts. Wow. Yeah. And then so when they got a, uh, a piece of land, like a script, uh, they went by nicknames. And I don't know why they went by nicknames in those days, but uh, in Cree, I, I can't pronounce the, how you would say Ghost Keeper. It's a, it's a name that long in Cree written. And uh, so we just kept the name Ghostkeeper. There are a few family members that went back to Richard's. Gotcha. But for you guys, it started with your grandfather. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. So we just kept the name. Now, do you yourself have any nicknames that you go by? No, no, I don't. Okay, that's all right. And uh, can you tell us about the lineage uh, of your parents? Let's start there. Oh, my. My dad was born in uh, Alberta, uh, Prairie River it's called, it was called, and I think now it's High Prairie. And 19, he was saying he was born in 1921 because he wanted to enlist in the army. <laughs> I was looking at his birth certificate this morning, I said, what, he was born in 1922? <laughs> yeah, so, but I heard the story that he did lie about his age so he could enlist. And my mom was born in Sturgeon Lake, Alberta. Yeah. And uh, what about uh, your grandparents? Do you know about their lineage? Uh, well, my grandparents, uh, uh, I don't, I don't really know where they were born. Yeah, I, I had, I, I have the lineage at home. I should have, I, I should have bought it and referred to that. But that's okay. Yeah. Um, what about uh, siblings? Do you have any siblings yourself? I do. Uh, we had uh, eight in our family. 
and uh, now there's only two of us left. And where do you fit into the eight? Uh, the second youngest. Youngest, okay. And uh, do you yourself have any children or grandchildren? Yes, we do. Uh, my husband and I are a blended family. Okay. Uh, he has two children, and then I have two of my own, and I ra we raised our goddaughter together. So we have five children and 14 grandchildren. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Our, oldest our oldest daughter, uh, she has the oldest granddaughter and the youngest granddaughter of 14. <laughs> yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, now, what community did you uh, come from? Or maybe to make it a little bit more specific, like which uh, community did you spend your childhood in? I could say Chetland. Chetland? Yeah, Chetland has a lot of memories. Uh, my dad worked with the BC Hydro Construction. He got hired on um, uh, to nego negotiate, the, he was telling us, to, with the, going through the uh, native territories. And then for the line, uh, BC line, uh, hydro line to go through their territories. So he would no negotiate with, with the chiefs and, and then in turn, uh, like they would, he would hire the native people from that community to work in the clearing of the land for the power lines. And the power line, I remember my dad worked at the hydro dam when they first built. Uh, and uh, it took him all the way to Vancouver, following the line to clear. What years would that have been in, roughly? Uh, it would be in the 60s and, and uh, 70s. I don't really remember too much of, uh, of the eras because I was, I was away from home quite a bit. Yeah. No worries. And um, are you Métis or non-status? Métis. Métis, okay. Um, and which cultural group are you uh, part of? Like, are you Cree, Dene? Cree. Cree, okay. Yes. And so were you born in Chetwin? No, I was born in Puskupi. Puskupi, I'm sorry, you did yeah. say that. Yeah. And uh, were you born at the, like, at the Dawson Hospital? Or? It was in Puskupi Hospital. Oh, okay, yeah. fair enough. Yeah. And um, what year was that in? 1959. 1959, okay. And uh, do you recall any interesting stories about your birth? Well, not so much about my birth, but uh, I remember my dad's auntie, like I was, she was one of my uh, favorite aunties, great aunts. And uh, I remember when I first met my husband, I wanted to introduce her to him. And so uh, the Puskopi Hospital uh, turned into a nursing home. And then, so that's where she was. So we went to visit her and then she says, Brenda, wheel me down here. I want to show you where you were born, where you, where you first had your life. Like, <laughs> and I said, oh, okay. So we went down to the uh, delivery room and it just felt so eerie. Like, wow, this is where I started my life as in this room. <laughs> yeah, so it was pretty interesting actually to see yeah. I think not all the people get that chance, so that's pretty cool. Yeah, that was really cool. Um, now, what about um, your childhood memories? Can you share uh, maybe some of those? Like, what do you remember about your early childhood? Well, like I mentioned, um, it's very vivid because uh, I had polio. I, I got polio when I was 18 months old. Yeah, and... Um, like I spent a lot of time, years away from home and I went to the States to travel to get my um, operations. Uh, there was a Shriners Hospital for crippled children there. And the Shriners from Chetwin uh, sponsored me. Yeah. So do you just recall be basically being, you know, away from most of the time, yeah. but then eventually when did you, was there a point where you started coming back oh yeah i'd come i'd come back and then uh like it was just basic growing up like children i didn't um like i had a lot of cousins around me and stuff and with my disability like i couldn't really partake in any activities that they were doing like a lot of running around and 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 stuff like that i pretty much stayed close home like yeah
Has life changed a lot, do you think, in this community? Oh, yes. Since you remember those those days? Yes, yeah. Well, there was a lot. Like, there, we never had a Tim Hortons. <laughs> Uh, and uh, there was like uh, where the liquor store, um, Murray's uh, cold yeah. beer store, that was our main area for shopping, I remember. Oh, it wasn't uh, what we now know yeah, right as now. the IGA that yeah. wasn't there? No, yeah. And uh, I remember like there's post office was there, like where Murray's uh, liquor store is there. That was a whole post office. And the welfare office, any kind of office was there upstairs, and the post office was downstairs. And then the next door was our grocery store, and then there was another store called Five, five to Ten Cents Stores. So kind of like dollar stores. <laughs> they're like dollar stores now. They're five, uh, yeah, dollar stores. <laughs> Yeah. But back then, a dollar was much less. Well, I went longer, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, your money went longer. <laughs> but the equivalent of a dollar was maybe that. Yeah. Um, now, what did your parents do? Uh, you talked about your father working for BC Hydro, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Um, so what did your mom then do to support the family? Well, my mom, um, she worked like uh, as a cook at the first Chapman Hotel. Yeah, and uh, she cooked there for I don't know how many years. And then she was just in a hospitality business. And then up until she, her later years, she started sewing. Oh, that's really nice. Yeah. Do you sew yourself now? Yes, I do. Did she, was it because she taught you? Yes, yeah, yeah, she taught me well. Wow, that's great. And um, what was your first language spoken at home? Cree. Cree? Yeah. And where did you go to high school, or rather to school? Let's start there. Well, we, uh, like my dad, like I mentioned, my dad's job took us various places. So I remember uh, Prince George was where I started school. Then we'd come back, we came back to Chetland. And then I remember like uh, many years here at the schools in Chetland. Okay. Did you attend the, um, and complete the local high school here? I, I went up to grade seven. Seven? Yeah, I didn't graduate. Yeah, I, I, um, I guess I was being bullied. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah like there was this one kid, and uh, he would he would wait for me, just purposely wait for me to come in the door, and then he would copy how like how I walked, and then and then at that time it was really hurtful, as being like a adolescent, like you know. He, you know, you just want to fit in. And then he didn't make me fit in. And then so I told my parents, I said, I hate school. I don't want to ever go back to school. And then so the, I tried homeschooling and that didn't work. So I just dropped out of school. But I know the importance of education. So I went back as a young, young adult, basic education, and I got my GED. Yeah, so I did. I did get my grade 12. <laughs> Good. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Um, is there Are there any other vivid mem memories from your school time or maybe after when you got your GED that you uh, want to pass on from that? Well, um, yeah, I went I went uh, further. Like I did office administration. Like I, I knew I had to cho uh, choose jobs where I would be like a sit down job for me, uh, like with my disability. And uh, so I, I did that, and then uh, I, after, after that, I, like, I moved to Prince George, and um, I started bingo as, a, like, there was an organization in, in Prince George. He was actually my dad's uh, first cousin, and then he wanted somebody to help him get started in doing bingo so they can raise funds for the community, and his was sports. And uh, it was a really good organization. So I started uh, running a lot of bingos, like uh, my name was getting out there. So I worked for the C CNIB uh, to, for, to manage their bingos. And uh, there was a couple like all along uh, like clubs, like, and then 
it was just getting tiresome. Like I then, and that's when I met my husband in Prince George. And then that's when we decided to move back to Chetwin in, in 1994. Okay. Gotcha. Now, that fits in perfectly with what I was going to ask you about uh, now, which is about, uh, tell us about uh, your family life. Um, so we already went over uh, that you're the second out of eight. Is that correct? Yes. And um, you kind of already told us about your childhood, but what was your, um, I guess, family life uh, after you got married? Um, well, we didn't really get married at right when we met. I, I made sure that he was the right one. It took seven years <laughs> when we moved back to Chetwin and then we got married here. <laughs> And it was really good. Like uh, we we support each other well. Like he he wasn't scared of my disability. Like he oh, he he was just he's just a wonderful man. Good. And who would you say influenced you the most uh, at any point in your life? Would it be your mom, your dad, maybe like a grandparent or, or a sibling? Both parents. Yeah, my mom and dad. And why would you say that? Well, my dad, uh, he was very humble. He was a very humble man. Like, uh, he was involved in uh, the Métis organizations for many years, up to his death. And, uh, like, he got the uh, projects going for housing here in Chetland, uh, the Métis housing. And uh, he got uh, the housing started, was part of it, in Prince George for the Métis housing there. And he... He just sat on the board of directors for many, many years, and as well as the Legion. Uh, he was a Legionnaire and uh, honorary member, like him and my mother. And my mother had a grade three education. She wasn't uh, able to finish her schooling uh, coming from Sturgeon Lake. She went to day school at the reservation there, but um, she was she never actually attended. Uh, she had to quit uh, just to help support with the family, and she she she's she was remarkable because with her lack of education, like she couldn't read well and stuff, and I can only imagine what it was like for her to take me to Portland, Oregon, like that's where I. Uh, started my treatments and then um, to travel all that way not you know a foreign country I guess you'd say yeah, yeah so but uh, yeah I, I just and then for her to start her sewing and stuff and like she couldn't read patterns I remember like uh, when she'd make jackets she made jackets for three past presidents of the Métis so, uh, organization yeah, and they wore those jackets to negotiate with uh, Prime, Med Prime Minister Trudeau Sr. at the time. Wow. Yeah, and then another uh, gentleman, uh, I can't remember what, who was the Prime Minister then, he wore his jacket same. Wow. And then so my mother made those, uh, what she would do, she would get a, uh, she'd go to a thrift store and then she would get a coat that, it was the size of the gentleman she was making it for, and she'd take it all apart and iron it good, and she just traced the pattern from there and put it back together. <laughs> but they were beautiful, they were beautiful coats. She did beading and everything. It was so nice. Wow, I can see why that would be that would have influenced you in your life. Oh yes, yeah. I remember one particular like in uh, Christmas. Uh, she was sewing really like she got a lot of orders for Christmas and stuff and and then I was probably in my 20s like in the, well, 24 or so and she was working so hard and I said mom I wish I knew how to sew you know I, you know you're working so hard she said grab a needle I'll teach you <laughs> just like that so that's when my sewing started <laughs> It was just a basic sewing, but then as, as I got better at it, she, she trusted me to do the pleating of the moccasin and stuff. And yeah, so. That's really cool. Yeah. So that being said, do you do things maybe a particular way because of the way that you watched like your parents or your grandparents back then? Um, yeah, yeah, I do. What would I, be I, some I, things that you kind of, I guess you do nowadays? Yeah, because... well, my mother wasn't very organized. 
<laughs> because she had all her daughters to do everything for her. So as her daughters left, like, you know, she she was just like, ah, like, she, I, what, what do I do now? Like, you know, so uh, with that, I think I taught myself how to be organized and, uh, you know, just make sure all the bills were paid on time and everything because I helped lots after my sisters uh, left the home and stuff. So I was next in line. <laughs> it was your turn to help out. Yeah. Um, and what about uh, cooking at home? Who did uh, most of the cooking and were you involved in that? Oh, my mother. She was an excellent cook. You know, working in the restaurants and stuff. So she, she fed all of us well. <laughs> And did she uh, teach you any uh, traditional recipes or anything like that that you still make today? Uh, well, pancakes. <laughs> yeah, and bannock and just, just stuff like that, yeah. And you learned all that back then from her? Oh, yes, just watching her and my sisters and watch them cook. Good. And um, do you recall any big, like, changes or, like, upheavals in your family life, like... You know, what was it like and maybe how did you guys respond? I, maybe your your health maybe would have been one, but were there any other ones that were major changes? Major changes in our family life? Yeah. Um, not, not really. No, uh, we, we were pretty much close as a family. And um, no, there's no really any changes. Did maybe then... Uh, did life change for you at some point uh, after your treatments, or do you remember anything along the lines there? Uh, well, hmm. well, okay. Well, my parents, uh, like my my grandma lived here in in uh, Chetwin. My Marceline, her name was Marceline Desjolet and Bill Desjolet, and uh, where they lived, they lived uh, in Mogerson Flats. They were in the CBC documentary. Yeah. She was the one. Yeah, she was in Making the Hides. Making the Hides. Yeah, that's my cook them. <laughs> and then so uh, where they, that would be a big change, you know, in our family because where they lived, they pretty much lived in uh, homes that had no power. Yeah, like they would describe them in the CBC documentary as huts. Huts, yeah. And, uh, and with my dad being involved in the Métis, uh, housing development, all the people from Mogston Flats moved to, we call it now Sesame Street, but it's Wabi Crescent. Yeah. yeah, so all of us lived there with power, uh, with running water. Like it wasn't new to me because I always grew up have, having that in my life. But with others, it was something amazing for them, like to have power there in a the bathroom, you have to go outside. I remember my grandma, um, uh, Marceline, she lived right in the corner of uh, where the Legion is when you go down the hill. And then there used to be a road that goes up and she lived right in the corner. And I remember a story. I know you'll probably ask if there's any stories I remember or anything, but uh, I remember this, my mom telling me a story that oh, my grandma was up late sewing and, and it was rainy night. And then the, there was a knock on the door and here it was a couple and uh, they wanted to get out of the fr from the rain because they were hitchhiking. So my grandma allowed them to come and stay and she made a bed for them on the floor. And like she thought they were a couple. So they put them to she put them together on the floor. And then so anyway, a year or so later, they there was a knock on it was them. And then to thank her for bringing them together because they were strangers. <laughs> So just that one small move yeah. changed their lives. Yeah, yeah. And then they just came and they thanked my grandma for, for that. <laughs> That's really nice. Yeah, that was really neat. Um, what would you say, now switching gears here a little bit, what would you say were some of the most difficult times uh, in your life? And how did you get through them? Well, um, having my disability, uh, my weight was always a problem. <laughs> like I used to... Um, walk with the, a brace a long-legged brace that's and uh i i couldn't walk without it and then every time i 
I remember getting uh, my um, documents from Portland, uh, like uh, about my stay, my records, my medical records, I guess. And then I was reading them, and then they would say I was a happy, a happy chubby native girl. <laughs> Every time I came back to Portland, I was always chubby. <laughs> But they put me on a diet every time I went back. And so for my leg, right? And then every time uh, I'd go back, like I would break my brace. It wouldn't hold me. And I remember my last time uh, seeing my grandpa, Bill Dejolet, Um I was probably about 13. And I broke my brace too many times. They couldn't weld it together. It wouldn't stay. So what my grandpa did was take my grandma's moose hide uh, that she had tanned and is cut long strips of it and tied it really tight so it'll get me to Portland. <laughs> did it do the job? Yeah, it did. It held, it held my brace up. And, <laughs> and then um, I remember being like the doctors were just like, when they come to examine me, there would be a whole bunch of doctors. And then to see my brace like that and that kind of contraption was very funny to them. <laughs> but that, very innovative. That was one of my fondest memories of my grandpa. Oh, that's nice. And um, what did you do yourself uh, to, for play like or hobbies when you were younger? Um, listen to music. I love music. Um, Probably just uh, like my my family was involved in uh, sports, like was especially ball. Ball was a big thing in my family, and then I'd just be one of their biggest cheerleaders. I'd go watch them, and yeah. Did you yourself play an instrument, or did you just like listening to music? No, I just love listening to. I I actually bought myself a guitar this year. I'm, I want to learn how to play a guitar, yeah. Because my my aunts played guitar, they sang, and it, music's in our family. Yeah, so I think I got a little bit yeah, <laughs> in myself. Give it a whirl, see what see where it takes you. Um, can you maybe share with us a bit more about uh, you and like your personal family with your husband, like um, raising your children? Um, what was that like? Uh, it was good. Um, it was, education is very important, you know, for me, like, and I, I really wanted to get my children, you know, educated and, uh, because, you know, you can't get anywhere without a grade 12 education nowadays. And then I guess the only struggle is them with, uh, hanging out with their peer, you know, with their their friends and, you know, getting to go to school and stuff like that. That was just one of the biggest things about my children. Yeah, but they did make it. They did graduate. Good. Yeah. Now, did all of them go to post-secondary school as well? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, they all graduate grade 12. Oh, I was just wondering, though, did they all oh, uh, do, like, college or oh, university? College. Uh, no, my youngest one, uh, he followed my dad's footsteps into construction. Yeah, he's a heavy duty uh, machine operator. Yeah, and they, my goddaughter, uh, she, she went into the office field. And then, um, then the oldest one, uh, she went into the child education like uh, early childhood development and stuff. And uh, our other son, uh, he he's actually uh, like a semi-mechanic, heavy duty mechanic. And uh, and a daughter is, a, another daughter is a stay at home mom. And, and, a, and her husband prefers her to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good, well, that's nice. Yeah. And, um, Aside from working at the uh, the bingo halls, was there any other way that you supported your family throughout the years? Yeah. Uh, well, with that uh, knowledge uh, of running bingos, when we moved to Chetwin, I uh, Tansy Friendship Center, I used to do their bingos for them for a couple of years. And then there was a lady, uh, 
uh, that came to Bingo uh, that worked at, at Scotiabank. And then uh, that's where we did all our deposits and stuff. And she was really impressive how I handled the crowd. Cause I used to, we used to get a big, well, just about 200 people sometimes. Wow. Yeah. And uh, the deposits were always right on and stuff. Then, so I was approached by Scotiabank if I, I would come and work for them. And I says, well, I said, I don't have any really experience. I don't have education, you know, in that field. She goes, you're good at money and you're good with people. That's all you need. You learn as you go. And so I, I thought, well, I'm kind of nervous about it, you know, like because of the education wise. Right. And then uh, she's, my husband said, well, you know, if she believed in you, you should believe in yourself. She sees something in you. And, and I said, well, okay. So so I did, and I worked for Scotiabank for uh, probably about eight years. And um, I I can't, I couldn't do the job anymore because of my polio. Uh, my leg was getting weaker. I had a couple of bad falls. So I had to retire from that. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. And, um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your life in your community? Um, so what would you say you um, supported? And if so, like how? So for, I know, you know, you work the bingos, but is there anything outside of bingo that you would support? Perhaps any, like, uh, were you part of any other, like, society? Oh, the Tansy, yeah. I was part of the board there with them. And then uh, with the, uh, uh, the Métis Society, I, I was on the board and then Politics is a very hard thing, and it takes it takes a lot out of you. So I decided just to back away from it because it seems like you can't please people all the time, you know. And then and then uh, I'm very sensitive. <laughs> so I told my husband, "said I don't think I can do this anymore to volunteer my time and stuff. I I'm just a, a stay home kind of person, like stay within myself." Yeah. Okay. And um, do you recall any, I guess, memories or I guess any upheavals or changes while you sat um, on the board for either the Métis uh, Society or the uh, Tansy? Well, Tansy Center, like I wasn't part of the growing with the new building and everything. That's that's a big plus. I know we were when I was on the board, we were trying to get another building. A uh, different location that was always in the uh, works. And you're talking about the recent one that you guys moved into? Uh, no, it was another ago? a while back when gotcha. I was sitting on the board. Okay. What years would it, would this have been in? Uh, that would probably have been about in uh, about, about the two early two thousands, late two thousand. Is that the building that is across from A and W there? Yes. Yeah, that's where the we were as a board there. That's, that would have been the new building for you guys that you're discussing. No, no, no. The new the new building that they were looking at was getting was uh, the old forestry building. And that's going out of uh, Chetland a little bit. And then they just decided it was too far for people to walk up the hill and, you know. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, do you remember any difficult times in in your community or I guess any experiences that were difficult? for you and your community that stick out for you? Um, not really. Uh, I, like my husband and I moved here in 1993 and uh, we never really had any difficult times. Uh, just some floodings here and there. Like there is a mayor, oh, what was his, Merlin? Yep. At the Merlin time, uh, yeah, Merlin Nichols, he he declared as Chetwin as a, a, what do you call it, disaster because of the rain. And I just, that's all I remember. What was that flood like for you? Did it affect your yeah, home? Yeah, it did. Yeah, it got into our basement. Not only like ours, like the whole street was flooded. It was, it was terrible. Yeah. That wouldn't have been fun. No. Um, Okay, let's switch over to a little bit of culture and tradition. Um, 
did your family teach you like traditional crafts or did someone else outside your family teach you any of those? Oh, um, definitely. What are some of those that you were taught? Well, definitely um, my my grandma used to make new sides, but I never really got the opportunity to be taught how to do that. But my sister did. My sister, my late sister Albina, she would make, she made beautiful hides. And uh, it's a lot of strenuous work uh, to how to make a moose hide. But I was taught how to take the moose hide and make moccasins and mucklucks and gloves. and <laughs> Yeah, so that's what I do. And I do the bead work as well. You still do it? Oh, yes. Yeah. That, that is my business now. Uh, I'm a small business owner. Oh, wow. Yeah. And how long have you had your small business for? Uh, they'll be coming on to four years. Yeah. And so it's a home based business. Can you give us again, again maybe just a bit of a range of uh, what you make there? Uh, I make moccasins and wraparounds, uh, gloves, and I'm yet to make a coat <laughs> like my mom. <laughs> But the first, the first project would be a vest. I always wanted to make a vest for my husband. That's really nice. Okay. And um, was there, now you talked about how you guys admired your grandma for making her moose hides. Were there any other relatives that you guys admired because they had a craft or a skill that, you know, was traditional that was really good? Well, my family um, members, they hunted quite a bit. Okay. Doing the, you know, hunting and getting the moose and preparing it up and stuff like that. But again, I never went hunting with, so I couldn't tell you any hunting stories or anything. <laughs> but just just being around that, it was awesome. So did you guys get all sorts of like different like moose meat or oh yes, meat growing up? Yes, I remember um, one particular time my husband um, is from a, a different territory. Like he is carrier. And he comes from west, west of Prince George. And we thought like with him being status that he was able to hunt in this territory. So he went hunting with my one of my uh, brother-in-laws and uh, they thought like he has a status card that he's able to hunt. So they went up to my brother-in-law's trap line and they, and they got themselves a really nice um, uh, elk. And it was, oh, it was so awesome. And we got it cut up, wrapped. And of course you have to show your card, right? Or So uh, next thing you know, after we bought the meat home, there was a knock on the door and said, uh-uh, that was illegal. Did you get a letter from the chief that, that you're not from this area, that you have to get a letter or some permission to, to hunt in their territory? And then we said, no. So they took all the meat away from us. I didn't know that. I didn't know that you had to get a letter once you went into another community that wasn't your own. Yes. To yeah. get permission to hunt. Yeah. Yeah. So lesson learned there. Yeah. <laughs> no <laughs> kidding. Um, what about to aside from your uh, grandma and grandpa, were there other influential elders in your life growing up or even just as an adult? Um, well, my, my great aunt, like, uh, she ended up being in a wheelchair. She lost a leg from just diabetes and, but she was amazing. Like being in a wheelchair, like, um, every time we'd come to visit for a visit with her, that that's, that's the Métis. What, that, I don't know. I think that's just a native way, not just Métis. When you're, when you go and visit, they, a pair of meal for you. Doesn't matter what time of the day, you're served a meal. And then so uh, we tell her, no, 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 it's okay. She said, no, no, you're gonna have a meal. And then she, she'd she go in the kitchen and she wouldn't want to have any help. And she'd be in her wheelchair and she made us a really good meal. Uh, and I just admire her for that. Like, you know, just able to do things like that. So is she really like cared for people? Oh, she loved people. Yeah. Yeah, she did. She was one of, like I mentioned, she was one of my favorite aunts. Yeah. Good. And uh, can you tell us about um, the role of spirituality and ceremony in your life? Um, or maybe in, in not just 
personally you, but you know, growing up, your your parents too. Yeah, well, my parents were Catholics on both sides. Like my husband's uh, parents too were both Catholics. Um, but I got introduced to Christian. So I changed, uh, I asked my husband, like we were both married Catholic, yeah. um, but I asked my husband, I said, you know, is it okay if we went to a Christian church to try it out? And uh, to me, it's the same, like God's God, he's everywhere. That's right. Uh, but the, the Christian, I, I, I just like the worship. I like the singing and Catholic is just so, she can't speak or anything, and <laughs> that, I'd fall asleep. <laughs> connected more with the other Christian yeah, denomination Christian, that you went yes. to. Yes. That's nice. And is it one of the ones here in town? Yeah, well, in Prince George, when I first changed my religion, was in Prince George, we started going to um, uh, uh, Pentecostal. Pentecostal, gotcha. And then do you still go to a church here in yes, town? Yes, we do at Pentecostal here. Church. That with uh, Pastor George? Yes. Yeah. Pastor George. He's on our he's on our channel. That's how we know him. Yeah, okay. yeah, he's awesome. Yeah, he's a very nice guy. Yeah. And um are there any stories that you know stuck with you over the years that were passed down to you um from your relatives or your parents that uh, you'd like to pass on to future generations? Uh no. Um my dad would tease us, like, uh, not tease us, but tease my mom and said, um, like, after my dad got um, discharged from the Army, uh, he started working at the Hudson Bay store at, in Sturgeon Lake, and that's where he met my mom. And then he said, I, how I enticed your mother, I gave her candy. <laughs> <laughs> I gave her free candy all the time. <laughs> Who's going to get upset over candy? <laughs> Come on. They were married when she was 16. Oh, that's really nice. Yeah. Well, there you go. Well, that's everything that um, I had here to ask you, but if there was anything else that you wanted to share uh, or have maybe your kids or your grandchildren watch someday in this video, by all means, please feel free to share it. Yeah, I just, uh, like I mentioned, education is very important. And... Uh, to stay in school and you know do the best you can and um, family life you know I've lost so many so many family members like it's just heartbreaking like stay close as a family you know and that's the biggest biggest thing to have that family support you know with bet between family and my faith I, I you know losing all these people in my life is just would have been so de devastating, you know, but the having support of loved ones is, is awesome. Makes a difference. It does make a difference. Yeah. Okay. Well, good. Thank you again for joining us for the uh, Northeast BCVT Storytelling Project. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. <laughs>